Happy Earth Day! I'm Adrienne Mohan with the Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy and I'm so excited to welcome you to today's Earth Day celebration that we're hosting virtually. Today's presentation is co-sponsored by the PV Library District, the Friends of the Palos Verdes Library, uh, the California Native Plant Society, and the Land Conservancy. Today's distinguished speaker, Doug Talame, is the best-selling author of the book, Nature's Best Hope. The Conservancy is selling this book and it comes with an autographed book plate from Doug Talame. You can go online and purchase the books from our website. It makes a great Mother's Day gift or Father's Day gift, or you can simply uh, put it on your own shelf. It's a great read. Please also mark your calendars for Saturday, May 1st at 11 a.m where Doug Talame will return live to answer questions that you may have about his book or his presentation this evening. We plan to have three more lectures throughout the rest of the year. We'll take a look at the LA River and how drought has affected the Southern California region. We'll also look at uh, the enjoyment of the outdoors and also how artists are inspired by nature. We finalize our plans uh, in the coming weeks and months. We'll be sure to keep you posted. One last thing before we jump into the presentation from Doug Talame is we would like to invite you to visit the Abalone Cove Reserve where we're undergoing a large 13 acre restoration project. It's a, a wonderful way to see the landscape and also the ocean during this beautiful springtime bloom. Um, and we also invite you to consider adopting a goat as these goats help us with removing weeds and preparing restoration sites throughout the peninsula. And now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the University of Delaware professor Doug Talame, who will share stories about his experiences restoring land in Delaware and show some stunning pictures um, and tell stories about birds, butterflies, caterpillars, of course. And uh, let's take this dive in to learn more about how each of us can uh, do our part to help the environment. And we look forward to seeing you on May 1st at 11 a.m. It is a pleasure to be here tonight, and thanks, thanks for listening, everybody. I want to tell you what my idea of nature's best hope is, but before I do that, I want to return to what happened on the East Coast last fall. Not this fall, but last fall, we had what we call an oak mast. All the oaks in the red oak group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time, and this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained, so I took one of those, those acorns and just stared at it and I was rewarded. An insect started to chew its way out of the acorn and it chewed, made a little hole and then squeezed itself through. Looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy for a while there. Finally plopped down. Very dangerous time for this insect larva because uh, it's a tasty morsel. Lots of things want to eat it. So it's got to get to safety below ground and it does that with a little bit more squirming. Down it goes in about 30 seconds where it stretches in all directions and makes a chamber and within that chamber, it converts itself to a pupa and stays there for two years. After two years, it comes out as an acorn weevil. Uh, there are acorn weevils all over the country. You have many of them in, in California. This is what a, a weevil looks like. Everybody thinks it has a very long nose, but in fact, that is an extension of the head capsule and at the base of that extension, way down here where the mouth parts are. Females take those mouth parts and chew a hole down into the center of the acorn turn around and lay an egg in that hole and that's how the larva gets down there. Now you might wonder why they spend two years underground and the answer is that uh, many acorns, particularly the red oak groups, take 18 months to develop. So if they came out the very next year they wouldn't have enough acorns uh, to use again. Well that leaves a hole, a true vacuum. You know nature abhors a vacuum. Uh, well she has filled it this time with three species of ants in the genus Temnothorax. Uh, where they, they love to live in the vacated holes made by acorn weevils in acorns. And if they discover a newly vacated hole, they get very excited. They tell everybody in the, in the colony, time to move in because their old acorn is falling, or falling apart. So they get busy in about 30 minutes, they carry the entire colony in there. Then they post a guard, can't find my pointer right there, make sure that nobody else comes in, no uninvited guests, and they will live here for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. Well, about this time, my, my wife says, what's your point? What are you trying to tell us? I'm trying to tell you that nature is built from thousands, millions of such 
types of specialized interactions. It's really a series of interactions that are highly specialized. For example, you won't have breeding pileated woodpeckers unless you have lots of carpenter ants because that is what they, they rear their young on. And you're not gonna have carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. Uh, you're not gonna have the beloved Amarginia, uh, a beautiful moth, that's a moth right there, looks just like lichens. It is a specialist on mistletoe, which in turn is a specialist on your California oaks. Um, so all these things weave themselves together. You won't have 60 species of native California bees unless you have the pollen of your, your native sunflowers, uh, particularly the perennial sunflowers. Uh, so if you have the pollen, great, you've got the option for 60 species of bees in your, in your yard, but if you don't, you've lost that opportunity. So nature is a series of specialized relationships, but today these relationships and nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, the problem, of course, uh, today is that we, we can't leave most of the country as it was because we have changed it. Uh, often we changed it, um, well, hundreds of years ago. There's only about 5% of the lower 48 states that's anything close to its original pristine condition. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We've grazed it. We have 770 million acres of rangeland in the U.S., which is four and a half times the size of Texas. And of course, we've paved it or otherwise developed it. We've straightened our rivers and dammed them, and you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our, our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers, and we've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up the natural world into tiny remnants of its former self. And each one of those remnants are, are too small and too isolated from each other to preserve the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. You might wonder why we've done all these things. Um, not sure, except I, uh, I, I would guess that the answer is we thought the earth, our nest, was so, so large that we could foul it forever and there'd be no consequences. But of course, we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing headlines like this at a pretty regular clip. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America has lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our North American uh, bird population gone. And the UN now predicts that we're going to lose a million species to extinction, possibly within the next 20 years. And I love the way they, they offer these, these headlines as if it doesn't matter. I mean, they might as well say, uh, we're gonna lose oxygen in the next 20 years and then go on to the next headline. This is not an option, folks. This is simply not an option. We have to make sure that doesn't happen. Well, I could go on uh, talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, and this upon all of our houses, but it's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It is a cure that will take small efforts from lots of people. But those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return to this headline uh, briefly. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Uh, well, the, the great Edward O. Wilson, E.O. Wilson from Harvard, told us what it would mean if we were to lose insects on planet Earth. And he did it way back in 1987 in this paper called The Little Things That Run the World. His message was very, very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, not only would it change the physical structure of, of terrestrial ecosystems, it would essentially uh, end energy flow through those, those uh, ecosystems. In other words, it would cause the collapse, the rapid collapse of the food webs that support our animals, our amphibians, our reptiles, our birds, our mammals, and uh, even our freshwater fish would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would, would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that right now rapidly turn over nutrients. And all we would have is bacteria and, and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is good news though, and that is uh, that doesn't have to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're gonna have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why? Well, because uh, humans are products of nature. 
we are totally dependent on nature. We're dependent on what we call ecosystem services, the things that nature produces to keep us alive. Here are some of the things that, that uh, plants do for us. And when I say us, they do it for all the living things. They produce oxygen, pretty important. Clean water, also important and slows slow the journey of, of uh, rain. Um, it's always heading towards the sea, but once it hits the, the ocean, it's too salty to use. Plants slow that journey down. They capture carbon, enormously important ecosystem service today. They're pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, fixing the carbon in their tissues, but then there's a lot of excess carbon and they pump it into the ground. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plant roots have deposited there. Plants build topsoil, hold it in place. They prevent floods, they dampen severe weather and lots of other really critical things. What do animals do for plants? Well, they provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds um, and again, many other things. So designing uh, landscapes, it might be beautiful, but um, landscapes that actually destroy ecosystem services is not an option. It never was a good option. Uh, but today with, with 7.8, 7.9 billion people on the planet, it's not an option at all. We need more ecosystem services today than ever before. There were visionaries uh, through the ages that, who recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with, with planet Earth. And one of the most eloquent was Aldo Leopold, early part of the 1900s. Uh, he wrote extensively. And one of the things he, he said when he was writing was, the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Uh, now we've had in, indigenous groups that have been good at doing that, but, but our huge Western and, and Asian extractive societies have been terrible at that. Uh, we we um, almost always take more than the earth have to, has to offer. Uh, and we move to another place and spoil that in another place. Aldo recognized that was not sustainable at all. So he had a dream that we humans would actually develop what he called a land ethic. In his dream, we would be able to use the land and we have to do that. We would farm it and lumber it and graze and mine and do all of those things, but we'd learn to do it gently. We would learn to use the earth without destroying local ecosystems. And that's what he called the land ethic. He wrote about in the, the San, his very famous book, the Sand County Almanac. What he never talked about was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why, uh, but I suspect that the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time. That notion was so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day. It's still embedded in our own culture that he didn't even recognize it as an option. Well, uh, tonight I'm gonna, uh, I'm going to push the idea that living with nature not only is an option, I, I'm gonna argue that it is the only viable option that is left to us. What we have to do is find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes. Living, you know, we have humans here, nature someplace else, that model just isn't gonna work anymore because there is no someplace else for nature. Where should we start? Uh, well, one thing we have to consider when we're, we're talking about the future of conservation is private property. And that's because so much of the country is privately owned. 85.6% of the US east of the Mississippi is privately owned. Huge amounts of California is privately owned. I think the figure for the entire country is something like 78% privately owned. If we ignored private property, we would fail because we wouldn't be doing conservation in enough places to sustain the amounts of nature that we, we need to do. Uh, but there are lots of, of eight, uh, areas that we don't ever consider for possible conservation centers that we should start considering. How about power and pipeline rights of ways or railroad rights of ways or roadsides? You know, 21 million acres, 3 million acres, 17 million acres in, in those types of rights of ways. Golf courses, 2 million acres. Airports, 3 million acres. The Denver airport is, is twice the size of Manhattan. I mean, these are huge areas. Then we have all the places where we live, both in rural areas, suburbia, our, our uh, exurban and urban areas, hundreds of millions of acres in those, those places. And you could think of other places, but just these, if you add it up, that's 599 million acres that we could be using for conservation that right now we really don't. How big is 599 million acres? Well, it's bigger than Vermont plus New Jersey, plus Maine, plus Virginia, New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, Montana, Texas, and California. You add them all up, that's, that's uh, 599 million acres. So not having a place to do conservation is not the issue. We have plenty of places we can do conservation. 
Now, when I talk about conservation, I'm, I'm really not using the word correctly. I'm not talking about going out and conserving pristine areas. We certainly need to do that, but there aren't enough pristine areas left. I'm talking about restoring nature, putting it back together where we have torn it asunder. Um, but in order to do that, uh, we can't just add species willy-nilly to our, our restoration. Um, we have to start with the most important species. Not all species contribute equally to ecosystem functions, so we have to start with the building blocks, the species that other species depend on. And one of the first things you have to do is rebuild a food web, which means you have to have the plants that are going to capture energy from the sun, turn it into food, and then of course that's the food that supports all the animals that are out there. But most animals don't eat plants directly. They eat something that ate plants. And that something is typically insects. And it turns out that caterpillars are the insects that transfer more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater, more than elephants, more than anything. So if we took caterpillars out of the system, most of the energy would re remain locked up in, in plants. And you, you would not have viable, um, viable food webs. Let me use the Carolina chickadee as an example. Um, the, you know, any of the chickadee species uh, are doing the same thing, but this is what we have here at, at our house in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, they're seed eaters during the winter, or at least 50% of their diet is seeds. The other 50% is insects. But when they're reproducing, their babies can't eat seeds. So they switch in totally to insects. Uh, and if they are in a healthy environment, they feed their, their young exclusively on caterpillars. And it turns out they're not alone. 96% of our terrestrial birds are rearing their young on insects, and most of those insects turn out to be caterpillars. How do we know that? There's lots of lines of evidence that, that suggest that, but uh, here's a study that my uh, PhD student, Ashley Kennedy, recently finished. Um, what she did was put out a, a call to bird photographers around the country to send in pictures of birds while they were feeding young, while they were carrying food to the nest. Uh, and she got thousands of pictures and was able to identify the prey item in the beaks of those the birds and then reconstruct the nestling diet for 20 of the common bird families in North America. The green bars are the percentage of the diet that was caterpillars. And in 16 of the 20 bird families, um, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, imagine what would happen if we took caterpillars out of the system. 16 of the 20 common bird families in North America would not be able to reproduce. So there is something special about caterpillars. What is it? Actually, several things special about caterpillars. And, and the first one is that they're soft. They're soft as a prey item. Think of this guy as a, as a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is, is exoskeleton, it's cuticle, it's undigestible. So birds don't want a lot of that. They want all the goodies that are inside that. And because it's soft, uh, you can stuff it down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring it. And if you've ever watched a parent bird feed their young, they're pretty rough. Their beak's like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Now, some of our, our birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They are nutritious. They're very high in fats, very high in protein. Again, they have a very low percentage of chitin compared to other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks much of a beetle is undigestible and they tend to have a lot of sharp edges. Excuse me. And finally, caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates and vertebrate, vertebrates cannot make their own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids, yet carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. So we all have to get our carotenoids from plants. And that's why my wife, Cindy, says I have to eat my beta carotene. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I got to eat my carrots to get my beta carotene. I have to eat my tomatoes to get my lycopene, my whatever that is to get my, my lutein. And she makes sure I, I do eat those things so that they stimulate my immune system. And I can't think of a better time to have a very strong immune system. Carotenoids are also antioxidants. They, they run around our body and protect our, our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality, improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about things like this, this uh, male prothonotary warbler. He is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutein's. And he makes pigments out of those lutein's, puts them in his feathers. And the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. 
Well, where are the birds getting their carotenoids from? What they eat, of course, but uh, when they're feeding their young, uh, this is what they're eating. They're eating a whole bunch of insects and other invertebrates, but the carotenoid content is not equal across those groups. The first two bars here are types of caterpillars, far more ca uh, carotenoids and caterpillars than any other type of bird food, followed by orthopteroids, the crickets and grasshoppers and katydids. Um, here are the adult caterpillars way down here, the moths and the butterflies themselves. They have far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. And this is the earthworm way over here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. Um, for most birds, then it's really looking like caterpillars are essential components of, of the diet. They are not optional. So let's just say birds need caterpillars. The next question is how many caterpillars do they need? Uh, well, that's a good question. Is one or two enough? Well, let's go back to chickadees because we've got a lot of diet on, on chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of chickadees? One or two is not enough. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to, to get the, chick, the clutch of chickadees just to the point where they fledge, depending on the number of, of uh, chicks in the nest. And after they fledge, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 24 days um, until the birds completely uh, reach independence, but they're flying all around. So nobody's been able to count those caterpillars, but you're talking about many, many thousands of caterpillars to make one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce. And if you want these, these, these chickadees breeding in your yard, you've got to make that many caterpillars in your yard because chickadees forage about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot, and that is true for most of our birds. And if we don't make that many caterpillars in our yard, that's called insect decline. And it's starting to look, seriously look like insect decline is one of the major causes of bird declines that we're talking about here. If you go to the uh, original data of Rosenberg et al, that says that we've, we've uh, lost 3 billion birds in North America and divide those birds up into the bird, into the species that require insects at some point of their life history, this group here, versus the species that don't require insects, the finches and the doves, uh, that can reproduce on, on uh, seeds and some other birds. They actually, ooh, come back here, come back here. They actually gained uh, some numbers in the last 50 years, but the, the bird species that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. So this doesn't prove cause and effect between insect decline and bird decline, but it certainly is suggestive that those two are, are linked. So I'm going to conclude from that um, before we lose all our birds that we need to start landscaping for, for caterpillars. So how do we do that? Uh, well, you add caterpillars to your landscapes by adding the plants that make them. Now, admittedly, this is a very different goal for landscaping. In the past, we've landscaped uh, in ways that would prevent any insects been from being in our spaces. Uh, we thought our plants were just decorations. We didn't want any of them touched. Uh, but then, of course, we had dead landscapes. So now we want to we want to put plants that support caterpillars. Seems easy, but there is a catch, and the catch is that not all plants make caterpillars. As a matter of fact, most plants don't make a lot of caterpillars, uh, and that's because most caterpillars are really fussy about what they eat. Nothing illustrates it better than the the monarch butterfly. Um, you can have all your ornamental plants from Asia in your yard, uh, or the ornamental plants from the the east in your yard. Um, and you won't be able to sport any monarchs unless you have milkweeds because that is what they have specialized on. And it turns out most of the insects that eat plants are what we call host plant specialists. They're just as fussy as monarchs. Why? Because plants have made them that way. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their tissues with nasty tasting compounds, secondary metabolic compounds that make those, those uh, tissues either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And if you don't believe me, uh, go outside and, and find a leaf and eat it. See if you like it. You're not gonna like it. Every single plant lineage uh, is, protects itself chemically with nasty chemicals. And that's why it's green out there. It's not because there are no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. There is a reason it is hard to get our kids to eat their vegetables. They inherently know that they're toxic. Yes, that's my little joke, but this is not a joke. Insects really do eat plants. How do they do that? 
How do they get around those, those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only eat the plant lineage with which, for which they have developed specialized adaptations to circumvent the, the um, plant defenses that are in that particular plant lineage. Every single plant lineage protects itself in, in one particular way and insects cannot adapt to all of them. So they focus on, on one particular plant lineage or maybe two that share common cocktails of chemical defenses. And they develop the enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those, those compounds, the behavioral adaptations, the life history adaptations that minimize their exposure to those nasty compounds but it takes a long period of evolutionary history with those compounds for all those adaptations to fall into place. It does not happen overnight. Uh, and that's why so few things can eat the, the eucalyptus that you have there in California because uh, it hasn't been there long enough. It's a, it's a plant from Australia. The insects in Australia can eat eucalyptus, but not in, in North America. They haven't um, created the adaptations yet. So all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to rebuild functional food webs in areas where we have dismantled them in the past, we've got to choose the plants that are going to support the insects that transfer the energy from those plants to other animals. If we don't, it's not going to work. And I'm going to give you three examples of how well it does work, starting with uh, our house right here in, in uh, Oxford, Pennsylvania. That's the southeast corner of Pennsylvania, about an hour south of Philadelphia. Um, I am sitting in that window right up there now. We, uh, there was a very old farm, been farmed from the late 1600s. So, you know, what, 300 years uh, that was broken up into 10 acre lots. Uh, the soil was absolutely exhausted, um, very little topsoil left. Uh, and what was growing here, which they were mowing for hay when they actually sold the farm was all the invasive species that had escaped from our gardens, multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and all the things that we have on the East Coast that are plaguing our natural areas. Uh, they would mow that stuff and call it hay. Um, so when they stopped mowing, when we started building the house, this is what grew back. It's just a tangle of, of Asian vines. Uh, that's a lot of oriental bittersweet and, and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and all that stuff. Um, and the entire 10 acres was, was covered. That is my wife, Cindy, getting ready to remove all of this stuff. So if you have a serious invasive species problem, don't despair. You really can. If you can't eliminate it, you can certainly get it under control. It is a lot of work. There's no doubt. But if, if skinny old Cindy can do it, you can do it. Uh, so what was I doing when she was removing all these things? Uh, I was telling her she was doing a great job. But I was putting plants back. And I did it selfishly. I've got a little hobby of taking pictures of caterpillars. So I always want to attract caterpillars to our yard that we don't have. And I started with the Canadian owlet. Um, that's a Canadian owlet. That's what the adult looks like. But Canadian owlets are specialists on meadow roux. Uh, there's no meadow roux here anymore. I mean, there used to be hundreds of years ago, but a long, long gone. Uh, no meadow root anywhere around us. So I had to get some seeds from someplace else, but I planted meadow root, grew really nicely. But I didn't know how long. I mean, this was an experiment. I didn't know whether the Canadian owlet would be able to find my meadow roo uh, ever, uh, or if it did, how long it would take. So I didn't go out and check my meadow roo. It was, it was a month and a half after it was up before I just walked by it accidentally. And I looked and it was almost defoliated with Canadian owlets. They had found it right away. I have no idea where they came from because there's no meadow roo around us. But that worked really well. Now we got a good population of meadow roo and Canadian owlets. So there you go. I've added two species to our property. Another example, this is the goldenrod stowaway. It's a misnomer because this beautiful moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's Aristosa. I did know where there is some Biden's Aristosa um, in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I went and got some seeds, planted them. It's, excuse me. I'm, I'm, having problems with my dinner here. Uh, it took about a year for the goldenrod stowaway to, uh, to find my Bidens, but it did. And now we've got a great population of both of those. So there we go, we've added four species to the property. I wanted Hackberry Emperor. It's a butterfly that ought to be here, but as its name suggests, that's what it looks like. It is a specialist on Hackberry and we didn't have any Hackberry. So I planted Hackberry, another tree that should be here. Uh, it took three, four years before those butterflies found our, our hackberry. But uh, now we have a good population of, of both again. I went out and checked 
one of my hackberry or just walked by one of my hackberry branches this June and there were nine hackberry emperor butterfly uh, caterpillars on that single branch. So another big success. So that's six species we've added to the property. I did not plant goldenrod. It came in on its own and along with it came uh, many of the things that eat goldenrod. In my neck of the woods, that's 110 species of caterpillars. So things like the brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparagonothus, goldenrod gall moth, they all came. Here's one that hasn't come yet, the goldenrod flower moth. And it's, it's beautiful larvae. I don't know why they haven't found our goldenrod, but they haven't. So this is, this is part of the game. This is anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year I check for the goldenrod flower moth. One of these years I'm gonna find it and that'll be a great day. I planted Virginia creeper. Uh, it's a, a beautiful vine here in the east, nice fall color. Um, and it plays nice, you know, it can crawl up our trees without pulling them down, without girdling them. And it supports a lot of, of beautiful sphinx moths, things like the Pandora sphinx and it's beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all found on Virginia creeper. And of course, many other things are as well. I wanted the zebra swallowtail. This is uh, the, the prettiest swallowtail here in the east. Uh, but this was, this was a real test because we were at the very northern limit of its distribution. It is a specialist on pawpaw. Of course, we didn't have any pawpaw, so I planted pawpaw, but the nearest population I knew of was 26 miles south of us. Uh, and, and I really wondered whether they'd be able to get up and use our pawpaw. We waited nine years, but they finally did. They found it. They found it, and now we got a population of both the, the pawpaw and zebra swallowtail. Um, and we have lots of pawpaws too. I wanted the double tooth prominent to, to come to our house because it's a caterpillar that looks like a dinosaur. I mean, it's, who wouldn't want that? It's uh, a, uh, an elm specialist. So we planted American elm. So now we've got both of those. Wanted the evening primrose moth. It's a specialist on evening primrose. So we added evening primrose to the yard. This is what the moth does during the day. You also have a specialist on evening on, on your primrose species, the Pacific green sphinx moth, beautiful uh, moth that you can have if you have that primrose. And we planted lots of oaks. Now these are just examples of the plants that we have added to our, our house. But I wanna focus on oaks for a while because across the country, not only here, but in California as well, oaks are um, the number one uh, species in terms of supporting caterpillars. I'll talk more about that in a minute, but this is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. Uh, and people argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old, but it illustrates what a lot of people think. They think you have to have enormous oaks before they can start contributing to your property. I hear people uh, all the time saying, I don't wanna plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. Well, unless you die before next year, you will live long enough to enjoy it. And I can say that with, uh, with confidence because I planted my oaks as acorns or as two foot bare root whips but I learned that right away, the things that use oaks come to those very small plants and start to rebuild the food web. And then you get to enjoy everything associated with that. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, the orange headed epicolema, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, uh, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the uh, spun glass uh, moth, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks that we've added to our property property and they come right away. Uh, this is a pin oak that has just popped up above the, the leaf litter and here's a crocus geometer standing on the ground eating the leaves of that tree. So you don't have to wait centuries for your oak to start to contribute. It contributes right away. Now this is a picture of, of uh, my house. I'm still sitting in this window right here um, taken not, not too long ago uh, to illustrate that we're traditional. We've got our lawn here but we put plants back. Uh, I'm still adding plants. Uh, who knows what the original plant diversity was, but we're adding plants all the time. And I recognize that every time I add a new plant lineage to the house, um, I find new caterpillar species, new moss species. So I made it a goal about four years ago to start taking pictures of all the moss species that have come to our property here in Pennsylvania. And I am up to 1,027 species of moss. Now we have 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. 
So on one 240,000th of the land area, we have 40% of all the moss species that occur in Pennsylvania. And each one of those species is a, a type of bird food. And that probably explains why we have recorded 59 species of terrestrial birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Uh, and that is 38% of all the terrestrial birds that breed in, in Pennsylvania. The point is that this works. You put the plants back and it, and it works. And, and by the way, was it two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we saw the headline that the World Wildlife Fund uh, has, says we've lost uh, two thirds of the wildlife on, on planet Earth in the last 50 years. All I can say is not at our house. Um, I'm, I'm willing to bet that we have increased biodiversity by two thirds at our house. Uh, and so that's the encouraging message. This is reversible. All those terrible headlines are reversible if we act now. I know what you're thinking though. Uh, you may not own 10 acres and uh, a lot of people live in suburbia. Will it work on much smaller properties? That is a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpster's house in Kirkwood, Missouri uh, and ask that question. They live on 0.6 acres, about 18 times smaller area than, than what Cindy and I have. And they're in a typical suburban neighborhood where they're surrounded by people with big lawns and, and uh, all those Asian plants. Well, the, the uh, serious invasive plant in Kirkwood, Missouri is bush honeysuckle. So the first thing they did was get rid of their bush honeysuckle. I was, I was visiting the Terpsters just before the virus broke out, by the way. Uh, and they planted lots of native plants to replace the bush honeysuckle, but they also put in a little water feature called a bubbler. And then they sat back and started to count the birds that use their property. They're up to 149 bird species, including 35 warbler species. That's almost all the warbler species in, in North America. And just to, to compare, uh, on our, our 10 acres, we've only recorded eight species of, of warblers at our house. So yes, it works on much smaller properties. Uh, and this, of course, is Kathy Kramer's yard. You can do this in, in California as well. I don't know if, if Kathy's counting the, the, the insects or the, the birds that use her property, but I guarantee that a property like this is going to support a lot of things. Can it work in urban yards, though? Well, let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago. She has one-tenth of an acre, which is three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. She is... Uh, she has, there's no connectivity with her little property in any other natural area. So she's just a tiny island. She lives right next to one of O'Hare Airport's runways and right next to Kennedy Expressway. So she's really in an urban area. Um, on her little property, she, she um, got rid of her invasive plants, put in 60 species of native plants, put in a little water feature for the birds, and then she started to count her birds, and she's up to 116 species of birds that have used her yard, including the woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, you can go to Pam's house and, and check it out. But what about city centers? 82% of us live in cities now. Well, in 2014, I was looking at this plant. This is uh, butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa. At least that's what people call it, butterfly weed. But it, it reminds me that we have a marketing issue with our native plants. We call them weeds and wonder why people don't plant them. So let's not call this butterfly weed. Let's call it Monarch's Delight. All right, 2014, I'm staring at Monarch's Delight. And the first thing I see are two species of leafcutter bees, megachylid bees. I know they're leafcutter bees because they, um, they carry their pollen on their tummy, not on their legs. Leafcutter bees have very specific requirements. I hadn't seen these species in a long time. Um, and I was very surprised to be seeing them here because not only do they require pollen and nectar, they require soft leaves, leaves like you would find on, on red buds because they carve out the edges of those, those leaves, roll them up into a tube and stuff them full of pollen and that's where they lay their eggs and reproduce. Then they put that whole package into a crack or a crevice. Well, there was a red bud growing right next to Monarch's Delight. So the, the uh, leaf cutter bees had everything that they needed. And because there was a red bud there, red bud blooms very early in the spring. It's one of the first things to bloom. It produces lots of forage for queen, excuse me, queen bumblebees. And of course, bumblebees overwinter as queens. There are no workers to help her out in the, in the springtime. She's got to do all the work uh, until she raises her first uh, set of, of offspring. So she needs very efficient uh, forage opportunities or the colony fails. Well, because the red bud was there, uh, she had what she needed and there were bumblebees there as well. And then I saw a monarch. 
actually saw two monarchs here, foraging on, on Monarch Delight. Now this was 2014. Uh, in the East, the 2013 was the low point of the Eastern monarch population. Only 3.6% of the monarchs left compared to 1976. I had gone all of 2013 without seeing a single monarch. And here it was, this was June. Um, so that's very early in the season for us to be seeing monarchs this far north on the, on the East Coast. It usually takes them much longer to get there. So I was really encouraged. It seemed like, well, maybe the monarchs are, are gonna come back. Why were they there? Well, they had monarchs delight. There was also another species of milkweed. So they had the, the nectar they needed, but they also had the host plant. Now they could start to reproduce. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of Manhattan. And this is the High Line. It is a renovated, elevated railroad that is now a tourist destination. Maybe some of you have, have been here. Uh, we're 30 feet above the taxis here, right in the middle of, of uh, you know, the heart of Manhattan. Millions of species go to the High Line to get a little bit of nature in the middle of Manhattan. It is hardly the place where I would expect to see monarchs or leafcutter bees. Somebody's doing a survey of the bees on, on the High Line. They're up to 30 species. Um, this is Rick Dark. Uh, he convinced me finally. I mean, he was after me to go see the High Line and see all the wonderful plantings for years, but I resisted. I'm not much of a city boy. And um, if I see pretty plants, I want to see things using them. And I didn't think anything would be in the middle of Manhattan, but I was totally wrong. Uh, and I'm glad I was wrong. It proved to me that um, even though the, the High Line is not 100% native plants. There are enough thought of na thoughtful native plantings there that uh, life has come to Manhattan. And if we can bring life to Manhattan with, with uh, just a few native plants, we can do it anywhere. But there are four keys to success that we need to think about countrywide. Uh, and one of them is shrinking the area that's in lawn. Now, now you people in California aren't, aren't the, the prime um, movers in terms of, of lawn, you recognize you don't have the water for it. But across the rest of the country, we have 40 million acres of lawn, which is dedicated to a status symbol, which is a dead space. Uh, it's the size of New England that is lawn. And we're still adding 500 square miles of lawn to the US every year. Totally unsustainable. I'm suggesting that we cut that area in half. We can, the area of lawn we keep is still gonna be manicured. We're still gonna be good citizens. We won't be thrown out of our neighborhoods. Uh, but we're going to put plants back in, in the rest of the area. And if we do that in half the area that's now in lawn, that will give us 20 million acres to work with. Uh, and and if, we, if we put those native plants that are supporting food webs back in that 20 million acres at home, we can cr create a new national park that we call Homegrown National Park. And it will be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all those parks, still less than, than 20 million acres. So we will have the largest national park in the country. And there are um, distinct benefits from bringing nature home to where you live. Uh, and this is this is a big one here. You you can develop a personal relationship with some aspect of the natural world at your own pace, at your own time. You can do it for the first time, or if you if you had a good relationship when you were a, a child, you can re-establish that relationship simply by walking out your door. You can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a, a national park uh, today, you're you're there with millions of other people. It's hard to have that that personal experience with nature. It's also free. There's no admission fee. It's never closed. No matter how many how many uh, viruses or pandemics come down the road, you can always go out in your yard. No travel hassles. And you can experience the natural world alone. That's the key there. There's no way you're going to develop that personal relationship with the natural world if you're not alone. This is particularly important for our kids who are now suffering from nature deficit disorder because they have no relationship with, with nature. Why do we want them to, to have a relationship with nature? Well, not only is, they, is it the tremendous health benefits associated with it, but they're gonna be the future stewards of the planet. We can't live without nature. And if we have nobody stewarding it, we don't, if they don't even know what it is, they're gonna be lousy stewards. So we're working hard to expose them to nature. And what do we do? We, we, you know, we get 30 kids, put them on a bus with a teacher. They drive for an hour and then walk around some natural area. Teacher tells them not to touch anything and they get back on the bus and drive home. And that's their experience with, 
like the natural world. I'm sure that's better than nothing, but um, it's really an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If you have some part of nature at home, you walk out the door, get your kids to experience it alone. No parental supervision. They've got to, they've got to do trial and error and figure out what works, what doesn't work. Maybe they can learn to hunt lizards. And I'm learning this from my own granddaughter. This is Zoe who lives in Hawaii and her piece of nature is pretty small. It's a, it's a patch of grass about 10 by 10 feet with a hedge, but there are anole lizards there. And this is how you hunt them, Zoe tells me. You get on the ground very, and, and you crawl very slowly after you have disguised yourself with, with leaves and sticks. You crawl slowly towards the, the lizard. No smiling. This is, this is uh, serious business here. You can wear your best dress, that's okay. But the object is to catch the lizard, put it in an aquarium, and then you, then you, can, you can study it, as she says. That's a personal relationship that, that she has developed. This is her little game. She does it quite frequently. I don't think she's going to be crawling on the ground with leaves and sticks on her, her dress for the rest of her life. But I guarantee she will remember hunting lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life. If you want to expose your kids to more than hunting lizards, get this book by Nancy Stranisti, Nature Play at Home. Um, hundreds of examples of how to expose kids in very small areas to the natural world. Okay, we're going to shrink the lawn. Uh, what plants are we going to put in the area we take out of lawn? Well, at least some of them have to be what I call keystone plants. Keystone plants. It turns out that um, not all native plants are equal in their ability to contribute to future, uh, um, well, to, to the food web that supports our animals. As a matter of fact, there's really just a few of them that are the powerhouses. About 5% of our native plants are supporting about 75% of the caterpillar food that drives food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that dries food webs, which means about 85% of our native, native plants aren't supporting that much uh, in terms of, of food web support. So the question no longer is uh, simply, are natives better than non-natives? Uh, on average, they certainly are, uh, but I can build an all native landscape that supports very little life because some of our native plants are really, really well protected. So the question really now is, do we want ecologically productive plants in our human dominated landscapes? Or the alternative would be benign plants or ecologically destructive plants, those, those Asian ornamentals that escape so frequently and, and biologically pollute all the land around us. I get emails once or twice a year from somebody reminding me that, I said, don't you know ginkgos? Ginkgo biloba from, from Asia actually grew in North America 7 million years ago. That makes them native. That means we can plant them and everything will be great. Well, yes, I do know that ginkgos knew and grew in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native, but, but I'm not going to bother because this is not our metric anymore. It's not whether they're native or not that matters. It's whether they're productive or not that matters. I don't care if ginkgo grew in the moon 7 million years ago. It produces zero species of caterpillars. You can put it in your yard but you're not going to support food webs. You can put your, your eucalyptus in your yard. You're going to support very, very little. What you ought to put in your yard uh, in many places in California are those very powerful California oaks. 271 species of caterpillars in California. In the Mid-Atlantic region, we have uh, 557 species, 900 species nationwide. There is no other um, plant genus that is nearly as productive as, as Quercus, as the oaks. And this is the power of keystone oaks uh, in, in my yard. So remember, I've taken pictures of 1,027 moss species. Uh, haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. So when I get that, that number will, will grow. But 1,027 moss species, out of the 1,027 moss species, 902 have known host plants. So there's 125 that we don't know what they're eating. Out of the 902 species that we do know what they develop on, 265 use oaks. We have 59 genera. Actually, that's wrong. It's 67 genera of, of native woody plants on our property. And only one of which uh, is, is the genus Quercus, the oaks. We've got hundreds of genera of herbaceous plants. So oaks represent less than 2%, it's about 1.5% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our total plant diversity but they're supporting almost 30% of our moss species diversity, which in turn is supporting a great deal of our bird 
diversity. That's the power of a keystone plant in your landscape. If we took moss, uh, oaks out of the landscape, our diversity would be clobbered. So how do you find out what the keystone plants are for, for um, your uh, where you live in California, I always talk about counties, but your California counties are so huge that luckily you have this, this um, feature called CalScape. Uh, in terms of finding the best plants for your, for where you actually live, Cal State, CalScape is the best tool in the entire country. I wish every, um, I wish every state had a CalScape, but you guys are the only ones that have put it together. That's wonderful. Um, for the rest of the country, this works pretty well. The Native Plant Finder from the National Wildlife Federation. You put in your zip code and the ranked list of woody and herbaceous plants that are best at supporting caterpillars for your county will pop up. Um, but California's, I would certainly use, use CalScape and they will tell you what the most productive plants are in your area. So we're going to, going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants, attract lots of, of insects, particularly moths to our yard, and then we're going to kill them at our security lights. And that, of course, is not the goal. There is a lot of research now, particularly coming out of Europe, that suggests light pollution at night is one of the major factors uh, causing insect declines, at least in the temperate zones globally. Uh, so we don't know why insects go to lights. After wondering about it for 100 years, we still don't know. But we do know that it kills them in lots of different ways. Uh, so the, the moths that are flying around and around and around the lights will die from exhaustion. They collide with the, the light. They get incinerated. They get dehydrated. Uh, the bat comes and picks them off. There are a lot of nocturnal insects that are blinded by bright lights. And it, it messes up what they're supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be finding mates and, and laying eggs, but uh, instead they're sitting on the, the side of the wall where your light is. This is actually good news to me. If this is one of the major causes of insect declines, it's also one of the easiest ones to turn around. Just turn your light out. What could be easier than that? But I know what you're going to say. Oh, I can't turn my light out because the bad man will come. Okay, put a motion sensor on your light so uh, it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're gonna, you're gonna discover is that the bad man doesn't come very often. Uh, now, if you don't wanna do that, take the white light that is in your security light or any of your outdoor lights and switch it out for a yellow bulb. And a yellow LED bulb is the best because yellow wavelengths attract far fewer insects than do white wavelengths. Mercury vapor lights, those big powerful security lights, those are the worst by far. Uh, if we were to switch to yellow LED lights across the country, we could save billions of insects almost instantly and a ton of energy. Seems like a no brainer. The fourth thing we have to do is to landscape in a way that allows our, our caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where 511 species of caterpillars develop on oaks. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, completes its development on uh, the tree itself. The caterpillars eat the leaves. They then spin a cocoon and hang from a branch. Then the adult emerges and they do it all again. Everything happens on the tree. And I wish everything did that, but uh, most don't. 94%, 480 species drop from the tree after they finish growing and they wiggle their way underneath the ground and pupate underground or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter under the tree. But that's the problem. We don't have any leaf litter under our tree and we mow everything and compact the soil uh, to the point where it's too hard for the caterpillars to wiggle underground to pupate. So this becomes an ecological trap. The, the moths come in, lay their eggs on these trees, the caterpillars develop, drop down, and then die. And the next generation is smaller and the next generation after that is probably gone altogether. I am convinced that this is uh, another major cause of insect decline. Uh, because of the way we, we landscape. And of course, the, the cement landscape is even less of a viable option for caterpillars. I'm not trying to discourage trees in cities. I'm trying to discourage the profligate use of cement as a default landscape. Uh, we know this is a bad, it's just laziness and it destroys our watersheds as well. This is what most people do. They have a tree in the middle of a big yard. Um, big lawn. Nobody studied what the, the survivorship of caterpillars is in a situation like this, 
but I guarantee it is much better in a well-planted situation like this, where you have a tree, then you have a layered landscape with the plants that are appropriate for your biome. Uh, so where, where we live, maybe a dogwood here, a native azalea, some ferns, ground cover, the caterpillar drops down into a safe site. The ground is very loose because nobody's compacting the soil. It can easily get below ground uh, or it can easily spin its cocoon in the leaf litter under here. It's not gonna be mowed, not gonna be trampled on. It's a safe site and survivorship will be much higher. This is where we do our, our spring ephemeral gardening. Um, and this is the way you can shrink the lawn if you happen to have any. Uh, you you uh, put your beds next to your trees and create more safe sites. Uh, if you have big bed around all of your trees, the lawn area would be much smaller. And this is where you can do use use ground covers like yerba buena, uh, good ground cover for uh, for California. Um, again, safe sites for the the caterpillars dropping down. Another PhD student, Desiree Narango, uh, she's gone at this point, uh, but her research on chickadees in the suburbs of Washington D.C. Uh, tells us that there's actually room for compromise in our plant choice, and this is this is good news. She studied uh, population dynamics of chickadees in landscapes, typical suburban yards that uh, were dominated by native plants versus uh, yards dominated by um, the Asian ornamentals that everybody uses. And the first thing she found is when those yards are dominated by Asian ornamentals, they produce 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, the amount of chickadee food was reduced by 75%. Those landscapes were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. So even though there's nest boxes up in each landscape, the birds would come along and look and say, there's not enough food here to rear our young. We're not even gonna try. If they did try, those nests contained 1.5 fewer eggs, uh, but they were 29% less likely to survive. If they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings uh, and it took them 1.5 days longer to reach maturity. So you might say, well, those are huge differences, but when you put all that together into a population growth model, this is what you get as a function of the uh, percentage of woody non-native plant biomass in your yard from, from no non-natives to 100%. This dotted line is replacement rate. This is the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die every year. If you're reproducing at that, that rate, um, then it's a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking. If you reproduce uh, at this rate where you make more babies than adults die, you have a growing population. But if you make fewer babies than adults die, you have a shrinking, unsustainable population. Well, right here is where those lines overlap. So what that means is that when you exceed 30% of the woody plant biomass in your yard being non-native, when you get over into this area, you've, you're unable to sustain bird breeding bird populations in your yard. And we have measured the amount of non-native plants in yards where near where I live in Southeast Pennsylvania and Northeast Maryland and Delaware, 82% non-native plants is way down here in the unsustainable part. Uh, and I, I know that your, your California suburban yards are pretty high in non-native plants as well. But here's the, the exciting part. First of all, this is the first time that this has been measured for any bird anywhere. So people who doubt that their plant choice actually impact other, other creatures should check out this study. But this is the area of compromise I'm talking about. You can have up to 30% of your woody plant biomass in a non-invasive, non-native without destroying uh, bird populations. And to me, that's, that's good news because we love our, our non-native plants. And if I said, you're not allowed to have any of them, um, I'd have very few people listening to me. So this, the compromise is, is good. Can we get a, a um, pollinator garden into a traditional suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Sure we can, just put a fence around it. That formalizes, that, that tells people that this is, this is intentional. These are not a bunch of weeds, it's beautiful. You're, you're servicing a lot of different pollinators, which is really important. You know, the language we use to encourage people to, to uh, help pollinators, I disagree with it. We say, well, we, we need pollinators because they pollinate a third of our crops. Um, it's a very anthropocentric view of why we need pollinators. And it's also incorrect. It's really around uh, one seventh of our, our crops pollinated by, by insects. And it suggests to people that if you don't live next to uh, an agricultural field, you don't need any pollinators. 
That is not at all true. We need pollinators because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we would lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet, not an option. Where do we need those pollinators? Everywhere where we need plants, which is everywhere. And that includes our yards. How about this design here by Drew Latham? It gets a, a, a bigger, more sizable pollinator garden. Compare the amount of life that is here with the amount of life that is here. Zero versus quite a bit. Uh, and of course, your native asters. You've got so many great uh, plants that are, are great for, for pollinators. Don't forget those 60 species that use your, your sunflowers. Get a lot of those sunflowers in there. Another shot from Kathy Kramer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can. And more and more uh, states, at least before the virus, uh, were putting money towards this. Minnesota had a cost or has a cost sharing program to encourage homeowners to convert some or all of their lawn to appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. They help, they, they help you pay for it. There's an island in Florida that's paying uh, the, the residents to allow burrowing owls, listed species, to nest in their front yard, to burrow in their front yard. If you have a burrowing owl, they actually, you actually get paid for it. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written, with carrots rather than sticks. That's why people, you know, they, everybody would be fighting to have an endangered species in their yard because you get paid for it. Missouri had a, a uh, bounty on calorie pear. This is one of the most invasive ornamentals that uh, is still being sold today all over the place. Uh, but if you bring in a, or, or take a picture, I don't know how they did it, document that you've taken out a calorie pear, they give you a free tree replacement. And Fayetteville, Arkansas is doing the same thing now. And of course, hey, you have all your wonderful lawn replacement uh, programs in California, up to $2 per square foot rebate for putting in appropriate zero planting, xeric plantings instead of having that thirsty lawn that, that just doesn't belong there. I think we made three missteps in the early years of conservation. The first being, we've assumed that nature is important. We like it, we want it around, but it's not essential. That's, that's the misstep, which means when, when resources are tight, which is always, nature takes a back seat. I was in the Cincinnati Zoo uh, just before the virus broke out, and there was this wall-sized poster that said, you know, save, save wildlife for future generations. And, you know, this is, this is our society's view of conservation. I, our top conservation biologists talk this way. We need to save wildlife so our future generations can enjoy it. I mean, that was the language that Teddy Roosevelt used the whole time. We have to make national parks so that we all can, can enjoy this, these areas in the, in the future. And that's true. All of that is true, except it suggests nature's there just for entertainment. It's much more urgent than that, folks. We need to save save nature so that we have future generations. It's a little bit little bit more urgent. Number two, we've assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. I mentioned this in the beginning, but if we restrict our conservation efforts only to areas where, there, where we don't have a lot of humans, we're gonna fail because those areas are too small and too isolated to uh, be able to sustain the species that we, we need. David Quammen has this, this excellent analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are functioning like a Persian rug. And that of course is what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance, but I hate that I hate that language because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance. Even our yards, even our corporate landscapes, even our our, our infrastructure, all of it has ecological significance. So what we have to do is put the plants back. We need to glue our rug back together again, favoring those keystone plants that are supporting so much of the life around us. Where are we gonna put them? We're gonna put them in these, these white areas, these no man's lands, not just to build biological carters for plants and animals to move back and forth, but we're gonna make them rich enough so that they can live there. In other words, this is going to become good habitat and we're going to share nature right where we humans are. Our third misstep was to, to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists, a few ecologists, a few, few conservation biologists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility for every human being on the planet, but I don't know why. Every, every person on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystem. So why wouldn't everybody bear the responsibility for good Earth stewardship? 
It's the only thing that makes sense. You don't have to save biodiversity for a living, but you really can save it where you live. And I like this approach because it empowers each one of us. You know, today it's so easy to feel powerless. The Earth's problems are so enormous that, uh, it, you know, it's easy to think one person cannot make a difference, but one person can make a difference. Go out and plant that oak tree, shrink the lawn if you have any, get rid of your invasive plants, put in a pollinator garden. One person can do all of those things and you are now a, a critical cog in the, the future wheel of, of conservation. And you can see the changes. You can see that it works very quickly. It also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't worry about the entire planet's problem. Just worry about your little piece of the planet. If you own property, that's, that's obvious. You're going to work on your own property. If you don't own any property, though, you're not out of the picture. You can volunteer. You can help somebody who does own property. You can help a land conservancy or the nearby park um, that, to manage the properties that they, they own. Uh, all those places are short of, of uh, funds, short of staff, so they love the volunteers. So as property owners or as volunteers, each one of us has the power to fix uh, dead landscapes like this, and we certainly have the responsibility to do that. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate, and then ultimately our, our own fate. Now, I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much.